We live under the rule of oligarchy, but do we have to? In my last video, I introduced egalitarianism and looked at the writings of a couple of people who disagreed with it. But it turns out that video didn't change the world. Those couple of people were just the tip of the iceberg. There's still plenty of propaganda out there to smite. We're still getting told some people deserve more wealth and power than others. We're still being told to look down on people for not having the opportunity to become millionaires. And we're still getting told social hierarchy is an unavoidable fact of human nature. So we should shut up and learn to live with it. If you watched that video, you might recall hearing the term the Iron Law of Oligarchy. In his essay, Murray Rothbard invoked this law to support his claim that hierarchy and inequality are inevitable, that some will inevitably dominate others because they're just better. I'm better than you. Better trained, better equipped, better... better? <laughs> just... Just better! You might not know, the term he used comes from the book Political Parties by Robert Mich... Shells. Michels is famous for coining the Iron Law of Oligarchy. His conclusion that all organizing, or at least organizing to achieve political goals, will inevitably lead to a few people at the top controlling the organization and a mass of followers whose role is mostly just to perform basic tasks and pay dues. As such, there was no way to challenge social hierarchy. Try to stop it and you'll just end up recreating it. But what if it wasn't so inevitable? What if oligarchy wasn't so much an iron law as a product of a certain time and place? What if you realized it's possible and desirable to avoid it? Would you want to learn how? I'm Chris, and welcome back to the only show on YouTube with the 50% accuracy guarantee. When I started reading the Italian school of elitism years ago, I was impressed with their willingness to analyze the world as it is, in sharp contrast to people who assume a democracy is democratic. You know, for the people and all that. We're schooled to believe in democratic government, that other people can represent us by passing laws over us, and any deviations from what the people want must be anomalies. The elitist said, that's nonsense. Any political system, whether or not nominally democratic, would end up being presided over by a small group of rulers for their own benefit. Some, like Mosca, said this arrangement was morally good. Others avoided moral judgments to say, this is just how things are. Fortunately, at that time, I was also reading about anarchist theory and practice, so I knew better. First we'll look at what I think the elitists get right, then at the limits of their theories and the possibility for something more. Elite theory describes power in society as largely held in the hands of a small minority of the population. The disorganized majority, the ruled, can be coerced and indoctrinated by the minority, the rulers. Seems indisputable so far. Gaetano Mosca says we spend too much time labeling states and types of government, you know, monarchy, democracy, republic, etc., making regimes seem different on the surface while hiding crucial similarities. They perform more or less the same functions and they all answer to the local ruling class. The ruling class consists of people in control of political parties, high-ranking government officials, business executives, directors, and active shareholders, plus everyone else who translates their wealth into influence through lobbying. Not all rich people have lobbyists, but they still get the state to protect their property, which makes it possible for a tiny percentage of the people in any country to own, well, pretty much everything. Such individuals possess the most varied resources for threatening and corrupting public officials, ministries, legislative bodies, newspapers. Meanwhile, the wealth of the ruled majority is scattered around so widely in so many hands that even though it's almost as large, it has no power whatsoever to react. The tiny measure of upward mobility afforded U.S. citizens helps to foster in the people of that country the illusion that democracy is a fact. Elections, protests, and recall campaigns are how the majority attempts to exercise over the elite a spasmodic, limited, and often ineffective control. So there's your intro to Mosca and the Italian school of elite theory. 
In the classroom next door, Robert Michels wastes no time in destroying popular belief in democracy. In his time, so just before World War I, democracy was contrasted with its supposed opposite, absolute monarchy, which was dying out. However, actual democracy with everyone, or even just everyone in a party getting a voice, getting a say in how things were run, was impossible. His study looks at why even the most ostensibly revolutionary of political parties ends up being run by a small clique. For one thing, says Michels in so many words, look at who's running parties and why. Some of it's the old aristocracy with the same goals, but new messaging. Michels points out that despite appearing meritocratic, political power is still basically hereditary because property is, and access to property is access to political power. Other parties are more liberal parties, but the liberal parties don't really care about the people either. For the liberals also, the masses, pure and simple, are no more than a necessary evil whose only use is to help others to the attainment of ends to which they themselves are strangers. Any party aims at using the masses to attain power. But the intentions of the leaders aren't a complete explanation of the tendency for organization to lead to oligarchy. It's also because the political system pretty much demands it. Parties that want to win elections need spokespeople, strategists, people who write policy, people familiar with campaign finance laws, and rich donors. It's expensive to start a party, so most people can't do it, so they join an existing one at the bottom where their voices won't be heard. Being a mass organization, a party requires technical specialization, which ends up taking decision-making power out of the hands of the party rank and file and concentrating it in the hands of the leaders. The more extended and the more ramified the official apparatus of the organization, the greater the number of its members, the fuller its treasury, and the more widely circulated its press, the less efficient becomes the direct control exercised by the rank and file, and the more is this control replaced by the increasing power of committees. You know, like PACs and super PACs. Moreover, centralization guarantees the rapid formation of resolutions. Political parties require mobilization, which is much easier with a dictatorship. Ferdinand Lassalle, who started one of the first socialist parties, apparently said, The rank and file must follow their chief blindly, and the whole organization must be like a hammer in the hands of its president. Without this hierarchy, Michel suggests, a party wouldn't be able to respond quickly enough to crises, opportunities, or crisitunities. Michels concludes, for technical and administrative reasons, no less than for tactical reasons, a strong organization needs an equally strong leadership. But there are limits to how far you can take this theory. Michels mostly just studies the functioning of the German Social Democratic Party of his time, but he infers that all political organizing will have to lead to oligarchy to be effective. The appearance of oligarchical phenomena at the very bosom of the revolutionary parties is a conclusive proof of the existence of imminent oligarchical tendencies in every kind of human organization which strives for the attainment of definite ends. Except, it isn't proof of that. What about when we organize and relate to each other horizontally, as equals? Far from being an iron law, the tendency to oligarchy is historically contingent and can be overcome by self-governing in small units, consensus building, and empowering the most vulnerable among us. One way people avoid and challenge hierarchy is through mobilizing for mass protest. It's political action taken by a large group, and there is basic consensus, but only on the purpose of the protest and the one way it's been agreed the participants will protest. There's no consensus on the hows, the how-longs, or even the whys of more sustained strategic action. While they might have positive effects, like showing others you're speaking out against injustice, mass protests don't scare the ruling class when they follow the law and shake the hands of the police, but when accompanied by threats, like strikes, riots, or otherwise liberating space from the grasp of the state. You can march all day through the streets, but if you're not inconveniencing decision-makers or disrupting the flow of capital, you might be wasting your time. A march or rally is a temporary affair, not capable of making lasting change. I think a smaller, more permanent organization properly organized can have a much greater impact. And actually, a great video just dropped last week about all about mutual aid and how to organize. I'll talk a bit about organizing here, but check out that video because it goes much deeper.
You might also like these books. Organizations that want to get things done without asking permission learn to organize without hierarchy. They could be called leaderless organizations because there's no single leader or committee that makes the decisions, but they could also be considered, you know, uh, what's the opposite of leaderless? Leaderful organizations? Because everyone in them is empowered to be a leader. So members come up with cool ideas and then take the initiative to implement them as long as what they're doing is within the ambit of the organization. You can be a leader on one thing and a follower on another thing. You might need to get consensus from the other members, which might require you to explain the merits of the project. But if everyone agrees on the mission of the organization and it's clear enough how your idea fits in, the rest will probably approve. In my experience, it's not nearly as difficult to get things done by consensus as people assume it is. You probably do it with your friends all the time when you say, so, where are we going to go next? People give their ideas, you talk a bit, and then you go. You might even have spontaneously self-selected roles like the moderator who makes sure to respect the views of the shyer members of the group, the mediator who helps resolve conflicts, or the timekeeper who tells you, if we want to get there on time, we need to leave now. Horizontal decision-making is kind of like that. There are probably already various groups near you doing mutual aid, anti-racist and abolitionist work, etc. If you don't have any experience with non-hierarchical organizing, you can learn from them. I suggest joining a smaller organization because then you can really make a difference. But even in larger organizations, there are plenty of examples of empowering everyone and deciding by consensus. Here's one that seems relevant in light of events of the past week. In late 2001, a spontaneous rebellion erupted in Argentina when the government decided to freeze bank accounts to forestall a mounting financial crisis precipitated by the IMF-mandated privatization and austerity measures of the 1990s. In under two weeks, popular mobilizations ousted four governments. Against the hierarchical machinations of the political elite, social movements organized democratic neighborhood assemblies and workplace occupations around principles that were increasingly encapsulated in the concept of horizontalism. Occupied workplaces forged networks of mutual aid and assemblies formed locally before establishing inter-neighborhood organisms of direct democracy, guided by both the sentiment and the practice of consensus decision-making. This uprising was eminently prefigurative, as it sought to embody the society it desired in its everyday practices. As Marina Citrin argues in her influential Horizontalism, Voices of Power in Argentina, Horizontalism is desired and is a goal, but is also the means, the tool, for achieving this end. For many, it was more than an organizational form, it was a culture that promoted new effective relationships and communal solidarity. With all that being said, horizontalist movements have at times struggled to counteract the encroachment of patriarchal, homophobic, transphobic, white supremacist, and ableist tendencies that inevitably come when broad swaths of society are suddenly brought together. It's okay for an organization to give more voice and authority to marginalized and oppressed people. We live in a world brimming with bigotry and propaganda, and in such a world, it's okay for white guys like me to defer to people who experience the most oppression. Either way, different organizations have different purposes, and each one evolves as circumstances change and people come and go. You can find what feels like a good fit for you, or you can start something new. Let's wrap this up. Democracy has always been a lie, a way of letting people attain power and convincing the masses that's what they wanted. Letting a few people wield power and saying it's the will of the people. A way of legitimizing everything the government does because they want to vote, so it must be right. Now fascist parties in the US and Europe are on the brink of winning power because the road to power is paved for them. Everything they do People will grumble, but most people will not fight them because there was an election. And if there's an election, the government must be legitimate. And it's illegitimate to fight them. Is that what you think? I sure hope not. But that's what the word democracy does to the brain. We should either reject it or redefine it to mean people empowered to organize as equals, to bring down social hierarchy, and take their freedom back.